here in Ireland a subtropical garden. We're in the kitchen at the Ballymaloe Cooking School with Irish celebrity chef Doreen Allen with ideas for all of those summer zucchini. All this and more coming up just ahead, right here on the Victory Garden. Behind me, the Atlantic Ocean. Ahead of us today, the Gardens of Doreen. Now this is an amazing landscape for three reasons. The first is its size. Over 100 acres in extent, it is a formidable garden indeed. But more importantly, this is a subtropical climate here in Doreen, a garden that's warmed by the Gulf Stream. So things grow here that you'll not see anywhere else in Ireland. And finally, because this garden was planted 150 years ago, things are of an incredible size and scope. It's kind of like a garden lost in time. Let's go see. To understand and appreciate Doreen, the first thing you have to realize is that everything here is an artificial construct. This New Zealand flax didn't just appear here, it was planted. And every part of this garden is actually man-made. The same flax was actually planted on that rock 150 years ago. And in fact, when this garden started, it was completely barren, much like this mountainside that we see beyond. There was absolutely nothing here until the first gardeners started work. This is the Bald Mountain 150 years later. Now nothing here is accidental and part of the first stage of the process was to drain these bogs. Now take a look at this. This is one of the original drainage channels hand cut down into the peat. Now incredibly these channels are still clear today to relieve the boggy soil of all this moisture. Now at its height, over 40 gardeners labored here six days a week for over a decade in order to create this incredible landscape. Today we have specimens here like this silver fir that must tower a hundred or more feet above my head. And notice this incredible lichen coating its surface. Lichen like this only grows in places where the air quality is superb. Here at Doreen, the plants are happy. For those of you who think that rhododendrons are exclusively foundation plants, take a look at this. This is one of the tree rhododendrons, and it is approximately 70 feet high by 100 feet wide. It's a single specimen. It was planted sometime around 1860 when Queen Victoria was young. Take a look at this. This is one of the hundreds of different types of bamboo growing here on the estate, and only one of thousands of different species spread throughout the acres. This is gardening on a scale unimaginable to us today. A garden planted by royalty, the fifth Marcus of Lansdowne, for royalty. And in fact, King Edward VII came and planted trees here. You know, I really do feel like some sort of character in a crazy 1950s science fiction film. Some sort of human dwarf amid the plant giants. Take a look at this eucalyptus behind me, towering hundreds of feet in the air with this incredibly beautiful exfoliating bark. Now here at Doreen, not only are the plants themselves old, but the species, many of them are ancient. This is an Australian tree fern and it is one of the oldest plant families in the world. It predates the dinosaurs and grows here at Doreen in a perfusion I have not seen outside the Southern Hemisphere. Now we have one more stop to go, let's go. One of the most satisfying aspects of this landscape is that even after all these years, the work continues. Now take a look at this. This is Aster anthra, a Chilean plant that has been set here only four years ago. Now it's climbing up this gnarled bark of this ancient silver birch and eventually will cover the entire surface. After generations of time here at Doreen, the planting, the gardening still continues. Now as I climb up the slope here towards our last stop, you at home may be wondering, what is the value of visiting a garden like this one other than the incredible aesthetics? Because obviously, unless you have a royal title or a huge trust fund, you're not going to be creating a garden of this size and scope. And I think the most valuable lesson to learn here is the use of the microclimate. 
Now, here at Doreen, the grounds are warmed by the Gulf Stream, but microclimates don't just exist climactically. They can be created by man. A warm south-facing wall, a protecting belt of trees, even a flower box sheltered by a warm, sunny foundation can allow you to grow things that you may never even have dreamed of growing. All you need to do is try and experiment, and who knows, you might be able to create a garden lost in time like this one. Gardeners find their source of inspiration from many different fonts. And today I've brought you to Skibbereen in County Cork, Ireland, to the garden of Robin Stonard. Now, Robin was inspired by his love of Asian art, in fact, these are some of his creations, to put together one of the most magnificent collections of bamboo in Ireland. There are over a hundred different types growing here, and he's going to show us some of his favorites. Let's go. Robin, this is an amazing collection. Thank you so much for showing it to Thank us. Thank you for saying so. Now, I got to tell you, it's a complete bamboo novice, and believe me, other than something I'll talk to you about later, my, my <laughs> runaway bamboo. This is what I think of as bamboo, the sort of fishing pole variety. What are we looking at here? Well, this is Philostachus vivax, aureocolis. Common as muck. Oh, Common as muck. <laughs> I rather liked but it. <laughs> one of the most widely planted and popular bamboos at this time. Now, is this at its full size, this clump? No, this clump's been planted here for six years, and it's now oh, 14 feet. It will probably do another 10, possibly. And do the canes also get wider as they uh, age? They will increase perhaps by half an inch or so in diameter. So that would make it'll, quite a fishing pole indeed. It would make quite a visual impact, yes. <laughs> yes. Now, I mean, look at over here. I mean, now here's this, this to me, my eye again, appears quite rare. Is this uh, another rare variety? Uh, not rare, it's very oh. popular, but this particular clone is a good one. It's a very black It's beautiful. Example. And what are we looking at here? This is Philostachus nigra. And where is this variety from? Um, believed to be originally China, but widely cultivated in Japan these days. I see. So they come uh, pretty much established all oh, around yes. the world. Yes. All right, so tell me something that is truly rare. Ah, yeah. now. A form of nigra here. Yeah? This is Philostachus nigra, Megarachiku. Um, only found on one very small island off the south coast of Japan. Unique because instead of a wholly black calm, only part of the calm blackens in the sort of second and third year. I see. So I imagine there's quite a, a, a competition among bamboo collectors to have some of these rare varieties. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. And, you know, collectors will swap. Are you all over the world. And you're constantly duking it out to try to have the uh, yes. rarest oh, varieties? Yes, there's a lot of competition. <laughs> a lot of competition. Now, i got to tell you, I promise you my story of my, my runaway bamboo. We have a dwarf little variety that's sort of spread into the perennial borders and has now sort of taken over anything. And any time you divide the perennials, a little bit of the bamboo goes with it. It's a nightmare. And I think a lot of gardeners associate bamboo with invasive plant. Is that really the case? I suppose it would be truthful to say yes. But there are bamboos far more invasive than, than others. I mean, do all, all bamboos spread? All, all bamboos will spread given the right climatic conditions. Warm soil, humid climate, they will wander. So, but here in Ireland, that's less of a problem because the soil is not as warm, right? Not as warm, so they tend to stay as clumps rather than spreading. Uh, and the nice thing is here in the lawn, you can just mow them down. Yes, <laughs> yes, or you, d or you dig up the section that is... Uh, invade it and sell it to somebody. Now tell me about this one, because this is absolutely beautiful. Are, are these two different species planted here? No, no, no. All the same plant. These are simply this year's, this year's canes. Ah, the so it all starts new out like this. Just, new leaves are just developing at the, uh, at the nodes. Now I imagine here with a fairly temperate climate in, in Ireland, most of the species are evergreen here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, because of course, since in our, our climate, a lot of these things have a tendency to sort of get whacked back and then they kind of regrow re from, from the base. Uh, that happens to a certain extent in England and on the continent. But here we're very fortunate. Temperature never drops really below minus two. Hmm. Now let's take a look over here because this, my, this caught my eye immediately. I mean, this, you know, spiky guy, I mean, this is a pretty amazing bamboo. Yes, it's not a good example. It's Chisquia culio, which comes from Southern America. It should be green and lush and absolutely beautiful like its relation here. Uh, for some reason, salt in the air. Oh, this is its, this is its, uh, this yes, is its sort yes, of sister? Same, yes, same family, same uh -huh. family. Um, this one has never performed well. 
So are you going to yank it so out? I think it's going to be shown the uh, crowbar. <laughs> yes. Are you vicious, are you you vicious need, with you your children? You need a crowbar to move that. I imagine. Well, how do, that's mm. a very good question. Yeah. You, you plant them, and, and then how do you get rid of them? Do you, do well, you have to divide are, them periodically? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But a, a big clump like that, you'd almost need a JCB to move it. No, earth move an earth mover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, here, this is a beautiful variety as well. What is this? Uh, this is Semirundinaria Yeshidaki Kimii from Japan. Mm -hmm. Slender canes, lovely green stripe. Doesn't grow much more than its 12 feet. And nice full, nice full. It's the canes spreads, are absolutely beautiful. Spreads moderately. <laughs> what does moderately mean for bamboo? <laughs> a foot an hour? Um, <laughs> No, but in 10 years it would probably have doubled in, doubled well, in size. Well, that's not bad. That's it's not, not bad. bad. Now, we'll make one more stop here. Now, this next door neighbor is also quite beautiful. I another, love this. Another South American Chisquia, this time the uh, Chisquia Gigantia, hmm. um, which will do hopefully 30 feet in this garden. I can see it. It's, it's, getting, it's pretty much getting up there. That's a fairly recent introduction, actually, to the garden. Um, 2002, something like that. Hmm. So four years growth. The four years growth yeah. has produced this entire um, mountain uh, of plants. It's a way, it's a way. <laughs> now we have one more stop to make yep. over in the next garden, so let's yes. go. Now Michael, this might, uh, might interest you, being a bamboo fanatic. Um, you being the bamboo fanatic just... and me being the bamboo novice, yes, okay. <laughs> you can always learn. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this bamboo has just flowered, in fact this is its second year of uh, flowering. Um, we know now that it has a flowering cycle of 90 years. 90, 9-0. Nine, 90, 9-0. So any seedlings that we happen to raise from this particular plant will be safe in your garden for 90 years at least. I can assure you that we probably won't be raising those particular seedlings for flowering. <laughs> we will be long since dust I'm by the time. So. I'm afraid so. so. But I mean, do you actually, do they fall to the ground? Do you collect uh, them that They way? will. If they're left on the plant, they'll fall and they could be lost forever or something will eat them. So the plant is actually thrashed. And, and these are the seeds, seeds themselves. You take, actually take, remove the seeds from yeah, here, right? Yeah, I think all the seed has fallen now, but it's just like a grain of um, rice or yes, wheat. It just sort of falls it's, out of yeah, it. Yeah, okay. and it'll fall. And then you raise them in the so greenhouse. So they have to be planted in the greenhouse, yeah. Now, I, I think I read somewhere that all these species flower at the same time worldwide, so they're all sort of genetically programmed in the same sequence. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes, yes. So everywhere in, around the world, this is flowering, and 90 years hence, if it'll be If it's related plant. to this particular plant, it will flower. Wow, yeah. amazing. i got to tell you, this has been a fascinating look into the world of bamboo. I want to thank you, Robin, so much. It's thank you, Michael. Very collection. much indeed. You're very, very welcome. And for you at home, you may find that this runaway plant may be your next runaway success in the garden. Welcome to the English Market in Cork City, a bastion of Irish food tradition since 1788 and a model for the revitalization of city markets all over Ireland. Here you'll find the best of the lush southwest, from the farm-grown lettuces and vegetables to the ingredients endemic to the region, the Duras farmhouse cheese and Cork's buttered egg. Dipped in butter at the turn of the century as a preservative, but today for the buttery flavor that makes a sunny side up English breakfast. Next, we'll visit the Ballymaloo Cookery School, where the philosophy is local, fresh, and simple. What a pleasure it is to be here with Doreen Allen at her Ballymaloo Cooking School. You're not only Ireland's most famous chef, <laughs> madam, but you are behind the really important slow food and sustainable food movement here in the country. Well, uh, I really love to um, link people up with the farm and with uh, fresh food. So a lot of the food that's actually grown in this garden, of course it's used for the cooking school and for Ballymaloo House, but then the surplus we sell at the farmer's market in Middleton every Saturday. And you also have a series of uh, greenhouses that produce all kinds of vegetables, don't you? <laughs> I know, we have an acre of greenhouses because we used to be in horticulture, so that's an incredible luxury. But why is it so important to you? Well, because, you know, the thing is, every culture has some saying that, our health goes into our mouth or our food should be our medicine so you know nowadays there's a real slide in in people's the kind of food that people are sure. eating and uh, a lot of the food is nutritionally deficient so it's incredibly important to me to actually get the message across that the food we 
we eat uh, is, uh, you know, it really, really affects the way we feel, our health, our energy, our vitality, our ability to concentrate. Well, your, your focus <laughs> and energy and vitality is certainly a testament to uh, what you preach. And this garden, I've got some uh, potatoes here, I see, and then beyond, a little uh, row of corn. Do you grow much fresh corn here in Ireland? Yes, we do, actually. We, we grow quite a lot in the greenhouses, but we, even outside, actually, this is a very sheltered garden again, so actually we'll get a few uh, cobs in this as well. It's incredibly sweet, this variety. Oh, wonderful. And this is companion planting. These little marigolds keep away the green fly off some of the other plants. Uh -huh. So we do a certain amount of that too. And are they edible as well? Uh, yes, they are edible, yes. You can sprinkle them into salads. And here you've got your zucchini that looks like it's still set, and I want to call it a cold box. What do you, what do you call well, it? We actually call these cloches, and we put the, the cloche with the little lid on, I on see. the little plants earlier on, and that actually helps them to come, it protects them and helps them to come faster. And actually here we've just left the frame around it and it well, exactly. supports the leaves it too. Supports the leaves, exactly. Well, you've yes. got your scissors at the, your knife at the ready, and we're going to go into the kitchen. So you want to yes. go ahead and well, show me how you cut your zucchini, and, and well, you know how often you do it between the flowers and the actual fruit. Well, the great thing is to actually get quite, quite small zucchini, mm -hmm. and so that they're not too large. Now that's the absolute largest one that I would get because really? um, you see, and here there's some golden ones here too. Look, this is also a good size because when they're small. They have, um, they really taste nutty yeah. and delicious. Mm. So, and the, and the bigger they are, the less flavor they have. So, this, it's good to, to harvest them at this size. And how about using the flowers? Oh, yes, we <laughs> use the flowers as well. We use them actually for stuffing, but um, so, or else you can scatter them into salads. So, oh, we'll use those beautiful. in our pasta later on. Well, we're going to go into your very famous school kitchens, <laughs> and you're going to show us what to do because, you know, no matter where you live, when the zucchini comes, <laughs> it won't. comes. We need ideas. <laughs> Exactly. One always has a glut, doesn't one? But there are lots of things to do with them. Drina, in addition to those beautiful zucchini in the garden, we've come back into the kitchen with some snap peas. Uh, sugar snaps, yeah. And I call them fava beans, you call them broad beans. Broad beans, exactly. So perhaps we should just uh, show people, um, uh, remind people again how to prepare these little sugar snaps or uh, sugar peas. You just literally take the top and just pull it because if it's, it's a sort of string down the yes. side it can be a bit tough and get caught it in your can. teeth so it's worth doing this and then we just blanch and refresh these in boiling salted water so until they're a nice bright green yeah two, uh, literally a minute or two and then uh, drain them and straight into cold water and with the fresh fava bean is it is not necessary to take off that that outer skin is it no i, I don't think well actually i don't do it because they're very, very fresh when they're very small but i mean look at these how yes. adorable are they <laughs> inside in their lovely little furry <laughs> nest actually i love shelling these it's one of the most tactile things well they have a lovely home here but now they're going to be combined with a zucchini into a kind of a summer pasta exactly a sort of pasta primavera but you can vary it you could put peas fresh peas as well rather than the sugar peas if you wanted to but i've got a cheats way of cooking pasta a cheats way i love that expression no. you use in the kitchen <laughs> cutting well, a corner I'm, well yes but I think Italians would be very disapproving of this <laughs> uh, so you want a great big pot of boiling salted okay, water that's so ready about to go. eight to ten pints of water and about a tablespoon or two of salt and then for this I'm actually going to use penne so add in the penne and give it a good stir use a really good quantity pasta oh, that sure. really makes a difference and then pop the lid on bring it back to the boil and cook them for about four minutes turn off the heat lid on the saucepan and leave them sitting there while you get the rest of the things ready. Perfect. And about eight, ten minutes until they would be al dente, basically. So you leave them alone in that nice exactly. hot water. Totally. And now combining the, the zucchini, you also have some blossoms that will exactly. be Exactly. Now, in the mix. so we're going to, uh, again, just to be careful not to get them too big, we'll keep those blossoms because mm. we'll use them at the end. Okay. But now I'm just going to trim off those little bits and they can go to the hens and then and, and they'll come back as eggs Nothing tomorrow. goes to waste at Ballymoreau, <laughs> that much we know. Good. So just cut these at an angle. About, now they need to be the same thickness yes. so that they cook evenly. Sure. Good, good, good. So golden and green. Now a little um, extra virgin olive oil in a, a nice hot pan. Add in a good dollop of butter as well. The Irish butter, of Irish course. Butter. So um, th that's, that's going to raise the heat a little bit with the olive oil exactly. and the butter. Exactly. Toss wow. it around. And then a little, we need a little salt and pepper here, Sissy. Okay, okay, here it comes. comes. Good. Some pepper. Oopsie. There we go. The color is just beautiful. And a little, I'm using Malden sea salt, so we like it, the flavor. It's very sweet and good. And now some marjoram. 
This is marjoram here, and it's a herb I absolutely wouldn't be without. And it's one that, you know, I don't readily, you know, reach for because I don't yes. know what to do with it, what it complements. fantastic with uh, chicken, with okay. turkey. It's very good wow. with roast vegetables, etc. But look, if you don't have this, uh, what we call annual marjoram or knotty marjoram, well, then you could actually use uh, basil. It would be really sure. good with thyme leaves but or even dill. But a big, generous heaping yes, exactly. into the saute. Now, let me tell you that this is one of this is one of the, the simplest ways we cook uh, zucchini anyway i'm going to use the word pasta here but it's fantastic as a side like dish this, as a side dish but the whole trick with zucchini is to remember that you need to take them out while there's still quite a bite in them because they go on cooking in the yes they do then they'll way. get a little soggy and watery go. exactly you ready for these yet? yes i could have put these in now this is a bit cheating but i'm going to throw them in at this stage okay there we go in they go toss around now what I might do is just put a lid on that just for a couple of minutes. Just I want them to stay lovely and green, but just to, uh, just to cook them a little further. Now um, I've got here. I've got my uh, the fava beans, which I just blanched and refreshed mm -hmm. again, literally for a minute, and the uh, sugar snaps. So they're ready. And the only other thing I need then is uh, some freshly grated parmesan or pecorino would do either, which is a very fluffy white. Pecorino. Mm -hmm. It looks great. Now, I cheated a little bit here as well because I cooked the pasta earlier on. Do you want to put it in the um, bowl or right yeah, into the sauté? I could do, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to, instead of doing that, I'm going to toss it Perfect. in here. I'm going to toss the pasta in with it. So, you just top in the pasta. Mm. Now, when the, as soon as the pasta is cooked, I toss it in a little really good extra virgin olive oil. Oh, to keep now, it from sticking. Yes, but not only that, but really good extra virgin olive oil is absolutely a shortcut to flavor. Okay, no question great about tip. it. Have we got a, a bowl there to pop this into? There we go. Now, so toss it around in that delicious margarine mm. flavored oil. And that butter and oil. Mm -hmm. Wow. In there. Good. So appetizing to the eye immediately. Now, this is really good just as it is, but seeing as how we have some um, sugar peas and some of the little fresh fava beans. You see, this is very much a wow. sort of summer pasta. It depends on what you have in the garden. So just toss it around like that. Oh. I'm going to put a few little zucchini flowers on top. As the garnish, and you know, and I saw these these pea sh uh, flowers here. Can I go ahead and add you those can. from you the garden? Absolutely. Once you know, again, completely edible and special. Good. And how about we might Oof. as well put this on as well? I mean, we might as well be do it seriously over the top. <laughs> this is what we called um, at the pea tenders. We called wizard's whiskers. So, and then sprinkle a little oh, uh, parmesan cheese over that the top. That is a summer afternoon in Ireland, <laughs> if I have ever seen it. And, and it's also good cold, actually, or room temperature. Room temperature. It's wonderful. It really brings out that exactly. flavor. Mmm. I've got to get a fava bean, my favorite. <laughs> Oh, you're yeah. not to eat all the fava beans. Mm -hmm. Leave some for me. Oh. I promise not to pick them out. You know, it has been the most amazing trip to Ireland with you. And, of course, the trip from the garden to the table, extra special. Thank you so much for all the wonderful things well, you've taught thank, us. Thank I've you, Cecilia. immensely. Good. Thank you. Well, everybody, that's all the time we have for this week. But remember, if you have questions about anything you've seen on the show, be sure to check out our website at pbs.org. Until next week, I'm Michael Weisson, hoping to see you back here at the Victory Garden. Spend more time in the Victory Garden by visiting PBS online.